Hello. I think there are people still joining at the yeah. moment. The um, the few people at the bottom. We are going to wait for a few minutes longer until we officially start. Yeah. Let's see. Hello, Sandra. Hello, Oscar. Are you seeing these messages? No, yours not, Carla. Except the first two. Hello, everyone, and please come in and say hello. Yeah. That, that should be showing up to everybody, is it? Oh, here we go. Yeah. Right, I can see. Uh, Just for everybody's orientation, before we start, we do have some slight minor uh, connectivity problems this evening. So from time to time, one of us might suddenly disappear, become invisible or might not be heard. Please have some patience with us. Good evening, hello. Hello, hello everybody. Still some people joining us, I think. I think also uh, we've got lots of time zones. <laughs> yes. It's something like lunchtime in the United States, hello, in South America. Hello, hello, Douglas. Hello, Paul. Hello. Who else have we oh, got? Right. Hello, Jack. Hello, Sandra. Hello, Simon, Jack. Good show, good turnout. <laughs> <laughs> Just a few seconds and we are going to start. Hello, Andy. <laughs> Hello, Aljoshva. <laughs> Greetings to Slovenia. <laughs> oh, we've got 26 people, it looks like. Hello, Anthony. Hello, Anthony. Hello, Kirsty. Oh, oh, nice Kirsty. to have you with us. Nice, thank you. Right. Okay. Well, let's start uh, with our <laughs> hello, uh, with our presentation, our book launch. Good evening, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us. My name is Tom Cooper. I'm from Austria. I'm working as one of three editors of the five at war book series published by Helion in the UK. Together with me this evening is Dave Watson, the author of uh, the book Chasing the Soft Underbelly, Carla, and Andy. Hello. Who are Hi. the two editors? Uh, together with me, we are three in the team, uh, editing the, for example, Europe at War Series, Africa at War Series, Asia at War Series, Middle East at War, and in the future, oh, I shouldn't forget, Latin America at War as well, and in the future there is going to be the series, technology, we are currently working on the first few works of that one, and they are going to be part later this year. But the focus right now, this evening, will be the book Chasing the Belly by Dave Watt, discussing the uh, military of the Second World War. 
evidence to handle and this book and something about it and how what is training. Hey, please go. Okay, thank you very much indeed, Tom, and uh, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining. Um, I, I'm obviously in, in Scotland, which is surprisingly sunny this evening, which is not a normal thing. So uh, if I'm sweating a bit, it's because we're not used to it up here. So uh, um, welcome and thank you. What I'm going to do this evening is is talk you through just an outline of the of the key issues in the book, and obviously we can we can do uh, a deeper dive to particular issues that you might be interested in in the in the questions and answers. But hopefully, it'll give you an overview of, of what the book's about. Uh, in a word, I suppose the book is really about how Turkey kept out of World War II, despite the best efforts of all the combatants of both Axis uh, and Allies. And that's predominantly why was um, Turkey um, uh, involved? Well, Turkey has a particular geostrategic position between Europe and the Middle East, um, obviously bordered by the Soviet Union in the north, uh, part of the Balkans, but also part of the Middle East. So it also had very important resources um, that the Germans particularly wanted, uh, particularly a mineral called chromite, which made hard steel. Uh, so it was actually, there was very strong economic links as well. The project to get Turkey in the Second World War was largely a Churchill driven one, which is why I put a picture of uh, Churchill on this on this slide. Uh, most people think of Turkey and Churchill as being um, Gallipoli, um, but actually um, Churchill was very pro-Turkish both before and after World War I and saw them as a powerful neutral uh, and saw them as part of his plan to attack Germany through the Balkans. Turkish policy uh, was, was, was not in tune with that right from the outset. Um, uh, Atatürk had a phrase, peace at home and peace abroad, uh, which essentially drove Turkish policy in this period. They were recovering from two major wars. Uh, and however, uh, as Atatürk himself said, peace is contingent on preparing for war. So they had a large army and large armed forces. So a few words about Turkey before the Second World War. Um, it was the, the Ottoman Empire uh, was defeated in World War One, and the Turkish Republic was created in 1923. Uh, they, uh, that was after the Greco-Turkish War, or what Turks would call the Turkish War of Independence. Um, but having fought two major wars, the population was decimated and the economy was effectively wrecked. The key player before um, before the Second World War in Turkey was Mustafa Kemal Atatürk. Um, he had a particular uh, policy, he was both nationalist and secular, he was a major reformer. You cannot underestimate how much change uh, happened between the Ottoman Empire and the Republic of Turkey. It was a one party state, but not a dictatorship in the way that you would see in, in, the, in the fascist states of, of Italy and Germany. Ataturk had a defensive foreign policy. He signed up to the Balkan Entente, which essentially, with the exception of Bulgaria, was most of the Balkans and was a, a treaty ally of France and Britain, but still retained strong economic links with Germany. All the time, it's a theme throughout the book and not well understood uh, by the British um, in particular, was the Turkey's main concern was not Germany, but the Soviet Union and to a lesser extent Bulgaria, which sat on its border. So, Ataturk died in uh, November 1938, and the new president was Ismet Inunu. Uh, he, uh, he took over, and he's seen as a, a, a continuation uh, in per terms of both home and, and foreign policy, but he did have to adapt to new circumstances. Uh, I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail, but I'll happily do so in questions. I'm sure lots of people are interested in the in the equipment and the technical side of this. But essentially, the Turkish army was a World War I army. But you've got to remember that that wasn't unusual for the period. I mean, most of the Balkan armies essentially were World War I armies in terms of equipment and doctrine. Turkish army followed the German 1933 regulations, but they didn't have the NCOs with the appropriate education uh, to carry that those regulations through. And their officers were generally a lot more of them, a lot more senior officers, and they were much older. Um, so clearly didn't have the, the initiative. They had very few modern weapons, uh, an armoured brigade with T-26s and later 
French R35s. And they relied very much to defend Istanbul on what they called the Kakmak lines, which were the old lines which defended them well against Bulgaria and the Balkan Wars. Uh, but they were reinforced. I, I spent well over a day driving up and down them. There are literally hundreds today of concrete um, defences. The whole year's supply of uh, Turkish concrete went into these defences. And unlike the Maginot line on which they were modelled, um, you can't outflank these lines because there's water either side. The, the organization of the Turkish army is pretty traditional, it appears. It's a tri structure. Um, and they have three armies essentially one in the in the east one in one in the west and uh, one in the sort of south in the main body of, An of anatolia they have three cavalry divisions and an armored brigade uniforms uh, the book has got some beautiful color prints my thanks particularly to the artists there uh, as it was a it was it wasn't an easy thing to do because um there, there aren't good examples i'm afraid uh, of of exactly what they look like and they would vary enormously anyway but essentially the officers were wearing fairly smart well tailored uniforms the other ranks were described as uh, as as very shoddy by all the military attaches um which obviously i've read all their reports as primary sources for this book um the air force had similar problems it was modernizing but they had poor maintenance um they, the training was limited they didn't do any night flying for example uh, poor command and control and the key concern for turkey throughout the war was istanbul is not the city it is today a modern concrete city it was a largely wooden houses and the concern was not unreasonably Luftwaffe would would um, bomb it with incendiary bombs that would burn to the ground fairly quickly. So this was a real concern for Turkey. Uh, no amount of anti-aircraft guns or aircraft from the Allies was going to persuade them that it was defendable. They did start to incorporate and uh, import equipment, some modern at the start of the war, like the Hurricane, the Marine 406 from France. All of these started to come in. And Finally, the, um, the, the Navy, um, this was the smallest of the services and the, they suffered from, from budget limitations. It wasn't seen as priority. Essentially a coastal Navy to defend the Straits, the Bosphorus and the, and the Dardanelles. Um, there was some modernization. The, the picture there is of the battle cruiser Yavuz, which is actually the, the German Goben battle cruiser that, that sailed there in World War I. It was modernized in the 30s, and they got some modern Italian destroyers uh, as well. So they had some modern ships, but as you can see from the overall chart there, it was a very small navy uh, and not really geared up to, to do much more than defend the coast. So the next slide is the first part of the book when we get into the narrative history of the period. I call this slide Wild Street Schemes and Reality uh, because they really were wild. Um, we had the Wagan Plan, which was the French general who wanted to reinvent the Salonika campaign of World War I, um, which um, there were various conferences in Ankara to consider that. The British thought it was mad, and they were probably right. Um, the French even came up with a plan to send airborne support to Romania, um, given they only had like, two um, airborne uh, uh, brigades at that time. That was pretty optimistic. The Romanians were scared stiff, um, as the Germans obviously had large numbers of panzer divisions on the border. Um, Churchill even came up with a scheme to sail the Royal Navy into the Black Sea, uh, which would have chuffed Stalin no end. He was already paranoid uh, about that, being a Georgian. Um, and when we had the Masigli affair, which was essentially a British-French plan to bomb the oil fields, the Soviet oil fields of Baku to cut oil off from Germany. And that involved flying over Turkey, which um, and it all came to light later when the Germans raided the French archives and published it. All of these died a death when the fall of France uh, and Turkey um, uh, then rejected requests to join the war. Um, arguably, they had a treaty obligation to do so, but the, the, the pragmatic, pragmatic position was that there was no way they were going to do that. They also didn't come to Greece's defence, or not that Greece needed it when Italy defended them. Um, and uh, obviously, one Operation Marita, that was when the, the Germans uh, invaded the Balkans, Yugoslavia, moved through Romania and Bulgaria. That brought the Germans onto the Turkish border, both in Thrace, um, in terms of Greek Thrace, and also in, on the Bulgarian border. 
Finally, we have Barbarossa, when obviously Germany invaded the Soviet Union. The Turks were delighted by Barbarossa because they saw that splitting the sandwich that they were in. In fact, the Turkish uh, foreign minister danced the night away on a table in an Istanbul nightclub. He was uh, that, that, that chuffed. The next section really is about what I call encirclement. Um, so this is where Turkey moved its forces to focus on Thrace initially. Uh, Germans, because the Germans were in the ascendancy at this stage, they were making good progress in, in the Soviet Union. Um, they were making progress in, in the Middle East. The, Turkey pragmatically signed a treaty. It didn't actually commit anybody to anything very much, but it did give the Germans the raw materials they wanted, particularly the chromite. In return, the Germans gave some, some uh, loans which paid for uh, new equipment, German equipment, including the Focke Wolf 190, which was really cutting edge for Germany at that time, uh, and the Panzer III and Panzer IV tanks, which equipped a whole um, tank regiment based in Ankara. We then shift the, the story to the, to the east, where, or the southeast initially, where the Iraq revolt kicked off. The British um, invaded Vichy, Syria. This brought British troops right up to the border. The Turks were a bit nervous about that. Um, and in more notes, a little known fact, but actually Japan was, was involved in the, uh, in the Iraq revolt, funded a lot of it, and actually had planned to bring troops. And obviously they were interested in the oil, uh, which is always a concern for Japan. That was reinforced when we got the, the Iran was occupied by the Soviets and the British. Turks particularly worried about the Soviets on their on that border, which wasn't well defended from their from their point of view. Um, there's a whole section in the book of, of some completely barking mad um, special operations executive actions in Turkey, where the British planned if the Germans uh, did seek to occupy Turkey or Turkey agreed to cooperate with the Germans to blow up Turkish railways, airports, the, the coal fields um, in uh, in northwest Turkey, a whole range of fans which, uh, you know, I've, I've read all the exchanges between the um, the Foreign Office and the uh, SOE and the ambassador was needed to say not much chuff with them either. Um, there's an important concept that called pan tourism, which is essentially about a greater Turkey. This wasn't mainstream government thinking, but there were plenty of senior Turkish government people and in the military who favoured this. And this came into play as the Germans approached the Caucasus. So this is countries that today we will call Azerbaijan, for example, uh, parts of Georgia, um, where there are large Turkish communities and, and these people argue for it. President Inuna was not a big fan. Uh, he did attend some of their meetings, but he clamped down on it later on, seeing, seeing the risks. And finally here, the most, seen, the most serious German plan to attack Turkey was called Operation Gertrude. Um, that would be attacked through Thrace with the Italians and Bulgarians, Rommel coming up through from, from, from the Middle East, and potentially in the longer term, uh, Japan coming through, for, through India uh, into, into Iran. And that was called Operation Orient. And there's a nice picture of a, um, of a, of a British propaganda booklet which explains uh, what, what this involves. It was pretty fanciful, but nonetheless, um, there, there was such a plan. Finally, we move into more diplomacy and deception, I call about it, in the mid to late war. Um, most, I'm sure most people will be familiar with the Mediterranean strategy debate where Churchill wanted to attack um, the Germans through what he called the soft underbelly, either through Italy or through the Balkans. Um, and this was brought to a head at the Adana conference. Adana is a, is a town in, uh, in the south, south um, east of Turkey. Um, and the, essentially he sought to persuade the Turks to come in there. As part of that persuasion, the British brought in uh, and provided large scale uh, modern weaponry to the Turkish armed forces, mostly the army and quite a lot of the air force as well. So this brought in like their armored brigades were then equipped with Valentine tanks, both the two and six pounder model and the picture in there of the Stuart tank. So there were there an air force that provided with Kitty Hawks, more Spitfires and so on. So that was to try and encourage them. The problem was, as if you read the 
the British training reports that are in the National Archives. Um, essentially, their view, the British officers as training the Turks took the view that Turkish officers were untrainable. Probably only 20% of the of the training were better in the armoured brigades, but in the infantry divisions in particular, they were pretty scathing. And in fairness, I, I initially thought this was just typical pompous uh, British um, colonial attitudes. But actually, um, if you read other areas, both the Turkish general staff accepted that that was pretty much the case and told the president accordingly. So uh, then we had Operation Barclay, which um, I expect most of you have heard of Operation Mincemeat, um, which was the sort of famous um, dead body dropped in, in Spain. That was part of Operation Barclay. And the plan was essentially to convince the Germans that Turkey was coming into the war and Britain would attack the underbelly through Greece. Um, that was followed by the Italian collapse. We had actual operations, the Dodecanese campaign, which was a, a shambles. Uh, Operation Hercules, a plan to capture Rhodes, which should have come first. There was no way of capturing the Decanese without having Rhodes. So all of those plans are there. Uh, and, and a lot of these are deception campaigns. So the British persuaded the Germans by uh, a guy called, uh, called Brigadier Clark, who came up with a whole range of schemes to convince the Germans that the Allies had more troops than they actually had. There's also a chapter in the book on intelligence operations. Turkey was um, essentially um, a, a hive of spying activity throughout the war uh, and there's a whole range of I've described all the different intelligence organizations that were busy doing uh, all sorts of strange stuff in Turkey throughout the war and that finally leads us to the end game um, the Turkish government realized that uh, Churchill actually lost patience after they provided all these tanks and aircraft and Turkey didn't join the war when they they half promised to do so in 1944 so Turkey, so Churchill lost patience and the Turks started to realise that with the Soviets arriving, that was a real risk that they could get uh, uh, sandwiched or at least have the Soviets drive on them. So they shifted policy, they closed down the, the Greater Turkey idea people, they reduced and then ended the chromite shipments, they tightened security, stopped the Germans sneaking materials through the straits. And they sacked the foreign minister, um, uh, who Churchill thought was pro-German, probably unfairly in my view, but nonetheless, that was done for that reason. Operation Zeppelin is essentially, some of you are probably familiar with Fortitude, which was the big deception operation with Patton in Kent, persuading the Germans that D-Day was going to be in Calais. Well, part of that was Operation Zeppelin, which again was an attack through, uh, through, through Greece. Um, I talk a lot about, quite a lot about resistance operations, they were an important part of this, but that story is probably better known than the rest of my book. Um, and then the Red Army arrived in Bulgaria, um, much to the horror of the, the Turkish uh, government. The 37th Army um, sat on the border of, of Bulgaria-Turkish border for a lot longer than you might expect. And we don't exactly know, but it seems that, that Stalin was weighing his options for a quick dash to the Straits. Um, and uh, so therefore that would be would have been interesting. Um, and um, but he eventually was um, Anthony Eden flew to, to, to Moscow, may have persuaded him against it, or he was using it as a bargaining lever to stop the Allies arriving in the Balkans, which he saw as his, uh, his backyard and sphere of influence. This was what's well known as the percentages agreement that Churchill sort of half did with Stalin at the time. And Turkey eventually declared war in February 1945. Um, and that was uh, uh, and that was the th their involvement. They didn't actually fire a shot. Um, it's not quite true what the where shots fired across the border and many Turkish aviators, for example, um, there's a there's a a, a cemetery in Istanbul uh, full of uh, Turkish aviators who, who, who died in World War II, mostly in training accidents, but few were shot down uh, around the border. Um, but Turkey declared war. Two divisions were prepared to go to Italy. And General Alexander, Field Marshal Alexander, was uh, was not too enthusiastic because obviously they'd seen no action. But two of the better equipped divisions were due to go, but the war ended before uh, they could be shipped there. So in conclusion, I suppose uh, I'd sum up by saying Turkey was essentially Churchill's project. 
um, you know, I, I'm always wary about the, the great man theory of history, but certainly this is a story of two men in particular, which was uh, Winston Churchill and the Shemeti Nunu. Um, they, um, they are the key players in this story because they did direct the war effort of their respective countries to a degree that, you, that probably didn't happen out with the Soviet Union and maybe to a lesser extent the United States. Um, the Soviet Union were always ambivalent. Um, they complained about the Turks, but obviously had one eye to as the war developed to their post-war situation. Hitler generally was fine with neutrality. It would have taken about 20 divisions to, to attack Turkey and then more to leave behind. He didn't see the benefit. If they stayed out of the war, didn't provide bases, he largely lived with it. Um, other people in the German high command were keener on, on attacking. Um, the, um, the Turkish position largely was it's not intervention unless we're attacked. The government recognised they weren't prepared for war militarily or economically. They were broadly, however, pro-allied. Uh, there's, there's a quote in the book around from essentially um, they, they, were, they were largely on us and did help in a number of practical ways. Very few British servicemen who ended up in Turkey actually were interned for very long. They were quickly slipped out of the country into the Middle East. Um, but there was a big economic impact on the country. You've got a million men were under arms in the Turkish army throughout the war. Uh, that was more men than they had in industry. About 600,000 worked in, in industry. Um, so it had a huge impact and there were rationing, there was um, starvation in some parts of, of Turkey. Um, and the Nunu's um, line when attacked internally uh, was that, um, yeah, OK, you may you may be hungry, but at least your sons are not dying on the battlefield. Uh, I, I paraphrase, but that's essentially what he said to them. So the soft underbelly strategy uh, was largely uh, it didn't get Turkey into the war, but it did at least keep them out of the Axis cap. And remember, Turkey was an ally of, of, of Germany in World War I, so that was a concern. Uh, and it also, all the, the talk about Turkey coming to war, the deception operations, the actual operations, the naval and others that I cover in the book, all of those diverted very substantial divisions away from France and from the Eastern Front. So it did succeed in, in helping uh, the Allies to win World War II. I'll stop there, Tom, and happily take any questions. Thank you very much, Dave. Uh, it seems my connection works a little bit if I'm leaned back. So let me just continue in this fashion. Uh, Dave, once again, many many thanks for excellent presentation i hope there are going to be a few questions i would like to if nobody minds misuse my position and, and ask you the first one uh, there is always lots of this or there are always lots of discussions about possible options and what ifs for example, Roma march through Egypt all the way to Palestine in the Middle East, wherever. And you have also mentioned that there were some people in uh, Oberkommando uh, who were interested in actually launching an invasion of Turkey. Uh, could you say, for example, let's say, what was the situation in 1991? What was the situation in 1942 in this regard in Germany, yeah. in Berlin? Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, you've 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 rightly used the phrase "what ifs," um, and and I I I, I did. It, it very it was very tempting to do a lot of what ifs in this book, and I resisted it because um, I think the problem with doing what ifs is that it's fine for the first stage, but you know inevitably it breaks down on stage two and stage three. Uh, and as, as many people will know, I'm a I'm a I'm a big war gamer, and uh, we love what ifs. You know, we uh, we uh, we engage in them all the time. In fact, probably do nothing else but what ifs in many ways. So, um, so so I will do more, and you can visit my blog and, and website, and you will see uh, various what ifs. So, but the book doesn't have them. Uh, the book very much focuses on actual plans. So if it wasn't in an archive somewhere, it doesn't get in the uh, in the book was my rule. Uh, so I'm sorry about that. If you were looking for or people were looking for uh, for that, um, I'll try and expand on that in, in other places. In terms of the Germans, um, interestingly, the, 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 the it, it was more the Navy, the, the Kriegsmarine. 
um, they were very keen on what they called a Mediterranean strategy. Uh, and certainly early in the war, they argued that we should, and, and, and obviously they, they, they may not have entirely been clued into whilst, why they, into Hitler's obviously view that he was eventually going to attack the Soviet Union. Um, how any senior naval officer hadn't read Mein Kampf is a, is a little hard for me to understand, but nonetheless, that seems to be the case in that the, the, the Kriegsmarine were very keen on strike. They argued if you knock Britain out of the Middle East, then essentially you underpin, you, you break the empire down because you've got the Suez Canal. It, there's, I mean, I, I put in the book the actual measurements of how, how long it takes to get stuff um, materials, equipment, men uh, around the Cape of Good Hope compared with whisking them through the Suez Canal. And the, the Kriegsmarine understood this in a way that probably Hitler didn't. Uh, equally, I have to say, Hitler's um, strength, uh, particularly in the early years of the war, he may not be much of a strategist in terms of military thinking, but he knew his economics. And so a lot of Hitler's drive was about the economic situation. So he was a key part to understand this story is to understand that um, his primary concern, once he'd invaded the Soviet Union and he lost the Soviet oil, Romania was absolutely crucial to the German war effort. Yes, they had some synthetic oil plants, but the only real oil came from Romania. And uh, if, if the British or the Americans had been based in Turkey, then bombing Romania, the Ploesti oil fields would have been very easy to do indeed. As it was, it became later, obviously, when they got to Italy and they did bomb uh, the famous raids around Ploesti and the the, uh, the airfields in in Viz and places like the places like that. Uh, so I think um, there were, as always, in when you study the German high command during the war, um, it's the nature of dictatorships that dictators play different people off against each other. And I think, you know, Hitler was quite comfortable to let the Kriegsmarine and the army and the, and Goering and his Luftwaffe come up with different plans and play each other off against each other. Uh, but there wasn't a coherent German military strategy and it changed and shifted as the war moved on. So I don't think there was a, a controlling mind, uh, you know, as, as we might say in, in economic theory around German strategy at this time. Thank you very much. Um, Carla, would you like to go on with some questions? Yeah, I was just going to jump in here, actually. I'm busy writing a huge amount of thanks from lots of people. Um, Douglas, Rene, Sanders, Simon, um, they're all coming in. Thanks for uh, an excellent um, presentation there, Dave. Thank you. Um, and we, we do have some questions. The first one from Sander. A uh, nice presentation. And he says, what is the author's connection with Turkey? Um, I think we've had a couple of other people asking about that as well. So, yeah, Dave, what is your connection uh, with Turkey? Uh, no, 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 no genetic ones that I've found yet. And I've done the ancestry link, um, which is very disappointing to me. Um, and my actual links are, are more with the Balkans. Um, uh, and people who know me um, from my, my website, Balkan Military History, and uh, my blog uh, will know that I'm known, particularly in the wargaming world, as Balkan Dave. Uh, this is this is well understood that I am a Balkan nun and have been for 25 years. I've run Balkan military history um, as a website. I've written uh, um, uh, dozens and dozens of, of, of articles and journals uh, and have every war game army you can imagine. So my interest is predominantly in the Balkans and obviously Turkey is part of the Balkans, both historically um and uh, and obviously uh, geographically because thrace is certainly part of the balkans um so my that's my interest and really i got into the turkish story by researching world war ii in the balkans and then came across as you do when you do primary res primary research in archives you um, you start to pick up some very interesting um, uh, documents and thinking i've never heard this before and if i haven't heard of it then click now what attracted me to the story was simply that um, 
you know, World War II has been written about more than any other war in history and probably always will be. Um, not just because it's more recent, but because people have got relatives who fought in it, etc. There's a, and you know, you would have thought there's no new stories to tell, um, but this is a new story and nobody has actually written about Turkey in World War II, at least in military history. There are some diplomatic... It's interesting you say that actually, because Anthony jumped in saying it's interesting to see how much we do not know about what was happening with Turkey in, in the Second World War. Um, he had assumed that they were pro-Axis yeah, rather yeah, than pro-Allied right. because of their involvement. Yeah, so, no, that's, that's absolutely yeah. right, uh, Carla, because um, and people often ask me, you know, was Turkey in World War II? I think it's the biggest Google question that's ever asked, was Turkey in World War II? Of course, the answer is technically yes, but not till February 1945. So I got into it that way. And, and also, I've, I've always had a long standing interest in Turkey, more their older history, to be fair, before World War II. Visited the country many times. I've got some, some good friends and you know, Turkish war gamers and, and others have been incredibly helpful to me. I must pay, pay credit, um, introduce me. Well, while we're on the uh, subject of war gaming, Dave, yeah. we do actually have a question specifically to war gamer Dave oh. from Jack. Yeah. <laughs> which which might be a bit specialised, but um, he says, how would you rate the two Turkish divisions that might have gone to Italy in 1945? If we are what ifing, what would a Turkish division be as a percentage of a US or British infantry division? Um, this is obviously quite a specialised question, which you may want to answer, Jack, directly on the chat. Um, but also, he, he does say, by the way, he enjoyed your book and thanks for taking on this topic. So I don't know if you want to tackle that. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Jack. That's very kind of you. Um, uh, the, the, it would have looked um, pretty much like a British division because while the Americans did provide some equipment through Len Lease, um, the training and doctrine was very much the British driving that until much later. We're talking the Truman Doctrine post-war before the Americans really got heavily engaged. So this would it would have looked like a British division um, with British equipment very largely, or at least American equipment that or Canadian built equipment that would have gone there. The, the the what if, if you like, is that yeah, it may have looked like a British division. But it wouldn't have had the, the the war fighting experience of a British division. Bear in mind, you talk about the Eighth Army was was working its way up the Adriatic coast of Italy. You know, none of these Turkish troops would have had anything. The view of the of the British uh, experts and those who trained the Turkish army was that the Turkish soldiers would have fought pretty well. They were tough, um, and later in Korea, that was that was we found that out to be true. Um, so the Turkish troops were pretty good, but their handling of equipment would probably have been limited. And um, uh, and I think we'd have had trouble with that, both in terms of less with the armour, but on techniques like artillery, fire and raging, those sort of technical areas, the Turkish army was particularly weak. So I think they'd have probably used them more in, in, in reserve or in, in real lines of communication rather than frontline fighting. Jack, I hope that answers your question. <laughs> uh, Rene's got one here. He says, do you know that Turkish Air Force have at the same time units flying Supermarine Spitfires, Mark V and Volke Volkme FW-190? Volke Wolf, yes. 190, 190 yeah. yes. Yeah. Thank you. Please correct me no, on my aircraft right. no, designation. No, no, no. <laughs> yes, I did. In the fact, there are quite amusing stories from uh, American Liberator bomber pilots uh, who were essentially um, damaged attacking Romania and couldn't fly back to, to Italy. So they flew to Turkey and were, were interned in Turkey. But when they flew across the border, they were panicking because Fock Wolf 190s appeared uh, in, their, in, their, in their vision. And on the other side, there might have been Spitfires or Hurricanes. Most, it was mostly Spitfires and Fock Wolf 190s who did the interception role. So if you're an American pilot, you think you've escaped Bulgarian airspace and suddenly a Fock Wolf 190 appears in your rear mirror and you start to panic. 
the the Turks actually were very clever. They, they they when they landed, the Turks actually ended up with a Liberator bomber squadron at the end of the war that they created by uh, cannibalizing all the Liberators they got. And in fact, if you go to Istanbul today at the uh, it's the the Koch Museum uh, in just on the on the Golden Horn there, they actually have a, a Liberator that was lifted out of the water that crash landed, uh, and they've been doing some work on it, so you can actually see one there. But the Turks ended up with a Liberator squadron, which was fairly bizarre. And the Americans provide them with no Liberators. They provide them with Marylands and lots of other stuff, um, but not with Liberators. But yes, uh, I was aware, and it is a it is one of those interesting things, particularly for war gamers, because you've got all this equipment, uh, Panzer threes and Panzer fours with Valentines and Stuarts. It's a fascinating uh, and fun part of the Turkish army in World War Two. Well, ironically, Rene Armando does still say, still lots of guns and artillery made from German crop. Yeah, crops. yeah. and, um, <laughs> and uh, from Tom's neck of the woods as well, plenty of Austrian um, artillery as well. Um, and um, from Czechoslovakia, of course, we want Skoda guns and the like. Uh, so the in, in the chapter I've listed um, all the sort of weapons the Turkish army have. The one job you wouldn't want in the Turkish army is a quartermaster um it would have been horrendous all the different sizes of the caliber of guns ammunition i mean the number of different rifles they had many which were rebored by the way by the germans um so they rebored them the i think it was 7.92 ammo uh to rebore the guns during world war ii they sent uh, something like hundred thousand to be rebored um so but it was a nightmare because they'd acquired all these weapons well, well, Simon has also asked the question, were there any other frontline military aircraft types destined for Turkey that weren't delivered? Because obviously we know that there was a huge amount of equipment delivered that they couldn't utilise or, or even... Yeah you know you so were, were there any other frontline military the only one aircraft? the only one that springs to mind was they they wanted the mosquito uh the de Havilland mosquito um because they actually had quite a lot of of fighter aircraft they had uh what 72 fought wolf 190s over 100 spitfires and then they had ground attack aircraft were largely the kitty hawks the, the p40s and the hurricanes or the hurry bombers as they became known later uh in in the war they were quite keen to have uh have mosquito. But turkey is a big country and the mosquito had range and so if you've got a small air force what you want to do is be able to get your air force and move it around uh and so that you can you've got range and the mosquito gave that to you they didn't get them by the end of the war but after the war they had they bought quite large numbers of mosquitoes so there are actually mosquitoes in service in turkish air force right up to the jet age um so that's the one that springs to mind most of the others they actually got um uh so um the, the the ones they didn't get were earlier in the war because obviously um in like they placed big orders for both ships and aircraft uh, and and guns and tanks with britain and france in particular and they didn't get all of those so they didn't get all the hurricanes they wanted they didn't get all the spitfires in particular because obviously in 1939 1940 britain had better use this for them than uh, uh, than uh, giving them to turkey so um so and and also there were there were destroyers that were due to go to to turkey as well and the royal navy just commandeered them which happens uh, happened ironically before uh, uh, to turkey before in the, before the first world war as well so they're rather unfortunate which is why today one of the reasons why today turkey learns from history and has developed quite a large um, um military industry of its own uh, because it, you know, well that actually sort of you know brings me to another question which sort of links into the one of the first questions um from oh let me have a look this is from paul who asked a question at the beginning saying it was very interesting and that he'll certainly be buying a copy um and he said that you mentioned that bringing yeah. turkey into the war was very much churchill's policy um and he, he asks what was the view of the chiefs of staff committee specifically brooke um and that then leads to to this other question here from libor who who also asks in your opinion, Dave, what was Turkey's policy successful? Did it bring benefit for Turkey or could they have done it better with more profit from them? So, you know, yeah, good. what do you think on that? Good questions. Um, I, I, the, it really was Churchill's project. Um, the chief of staff um, committee 
And obviously, Alan Brooke, um, for those who are not familiar, was for most of the war the chief of the Imperial General Staff. We know we have good, um, a fairly good resource on on Alan Brooks' views because we've got his diaries, um, which have been lightly edited, but but nonetheless are there. Alan Brooke blew hot and cold on the Mediterranean strategy. I mean, essentially, he understood that the Americans were dead against it. They saw it as a uh, as a diversion from Operation Overlord, um, and so, but he felt duty bound, obviously, as as an official to try and sell um, Churchill's view. But privately in his diaries, he was pretty skeptical. Uh, and he often, I mean, I think I, I used the phrase um, in the book, he said, uh, Churchill comes up with 10 new ideas a day. Um, one of them's really good, but nobody knows which one it is. Um, and which I think rather sums it Reminds up. me of Napoleon. Well, yeah, I, I mean, there's a, for, the, for those who are, probably aren't many on this call, for those who are cricket fans will recognise there's a cricket analogy very similar to that. Uh, so um, uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a common thing. Um, Alan Brooke also was frustrated, you see in his diaries, because so much of the planners' time was spent. You know, this is hundreds and hundreds of staff officers' time was spent responding to Churchill's, you know, midnight brainwave. And, uh, you know, let's say Churchill was rather fond of the bottle as well. So some of these ideas probably were produced um, with probably not, not, not what a modern military planner would, uh, would assume was, uh, was an entirely clear mind mm -hmm. on the occasions. Some of them were brilliant, um, but you know they really were frustrated with all these sort of bright ideas. So I think Alan Brooke blew hot and cold. Although in fairness to him and Churchill, you know he thought uh, the Americans were wrong not to support the Dedekinese campaign in the Eastern Mediterranean towards the towards the, the mid end of the war. And and if the Americans had provided more P P thirty eights for that campaign and provided more landing craft. Um, it might have been possible to take roads, and if they took roads, they'd have had the airfields to cover the northern part of the Cos and Leros campaign in particular. So, I think it's it's hot and cold. Broadly, Brooke was loyal, but you can see from his diaries he was a bit sceptical and understood why the American view was: why are we messing about in the Mediterranean? Let's cross over into France and go straight for Berlin. Uh, and that was particularly George Marshall, the American chief of staffs strong view and he threatened many times to scupper in fact threatened to send everything to the pacific um if churchill pursued this line and roosevelt sort of you know played play, as a politician that roosevelt was he played them both off but but generally supported the american policy turkey i think um i mean it's easy to say that the turkish policy delivered what they planned. I think, you know, Inouye's policy was very much one of uh, holding on to, um, uh, to, to, to keeping Turkey neutral. There's a book by a Turkish, I've uh, got it here near me, called a Turkish uh, historian uh, called Tamak, and, and he wrote a book called The Warrior Diplomats. And essentially, mm -hmm. the, the, what you have to understand about the Turkish leadership is that these were all guys who'd been through two tough wars uh, and they'd seen the damage they did to their country and you might think well they're all military guys you know i mean whose name is named after two battles that he led the turkish army in the turkish war of independence that's how he got his surname uh, so you can't get more military than than that he was a general um ataturk was of course a general all the senior politicians with a couple of exceptions were not politicians as we would think of them in Western democracies. They were military men. Um, and, yeah. But being military men doesn't mean they're necessarily gung ho for war. And when your country's been through tough, two tough wars, they saw the benefits of, uh, of following Ataturk's policy, which was our country needs a rest. It needs to recover, it needs to rebuild, it needs to strengthen its economy. So I think Inuna would have finished the war, as the anecdote I gave you earlier, by saying, I've helped our country do that. However, I would say that, you know, the country didn't, wasn't spared the economic impact of war. They may not have had the deaths of war that Britain or, or America or certainly the Soviet Union had during World War II, but they certainly suffered economically. And it took many years uh, for the Turkish economy to recover, arguably, until in recent times, it's never recovered from uh, from the impact of of the of the last century.
Well, Jack, Jack, Jack writes uh, an answer, you know, in, in response to uh, the, the what if to Italy. Uh, he said, great answer regarding that, the, the what if. Um, it would be great to have the two Turkish divisions as alt reinforcements in an, in an Italian campaign game, maybe as a two or a three each if a Brit division was an eight, say, but probably not on the line next to the Greek brigade. Yeah, yeah. So I suspect this is all part of the war gaming yeah, strategies going yeah. off down rabbit holes. Oh, no, it, 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 I mean, it's a very good point that Actually, uh, I mean, obviously, everyone knows that, that Turkey and Greece have had a somewhat checkered history, he says, putting in his best foreign office diplomacy. Um, but actually, before World War II, um, probably Turkey and Greece were at their most friendly, bizarrely. You would have thought, having ended a war, etc., and and all the big population exchanges, which were horrendous. Um, uh, actually, diplomatically, uh, Greece and Turkey were allies uh, before World War II. They both signed up the Balkan Entente. Um, and um, actually, their relations were pretty good. Um, Turkish politicians visited um, uh, Ankara, vice versa. It wasn't that. It, it wasn't that at all. And, and it's an untold story. Um, much to Turkish credit, I have to say that they provided food aid to, to Greece during World War Two. Quite extensive food aid, and they weren't exactly, uh, um, you know, flush with food themselves. But they, but because again, an unknown story, largely, particularly in the West. But, you know, I think it was about 450,000 Greeks died from starvation in World War Two. It was horrendous. Um, and um, Turkey did, you know, they couldn't do much. But what they did do, they did provide food aid uh, in there. And they also helped the Greek resistance, um, not the communists, it has to be said, but the, the right wing Greek resistance um, with arms and, and some weapons. And certainly there was, as I said, there was a shuttle boat uh, essentially going between the Turkish mainland and Greece. So relations were actually at probably at their very best at that time it deteriorated pretty rapidly and after the war i'm afraid to say but um nonetheless so but even so you probably wouldn't have put turkish and greek troops in the line together uh, probably probably a better analogy would be the brazilian division that was in Italy in, in World War Two, if you want, because they hadn't got, you know, they had a big army, but not a lot of, of hard fighting experience. So if you wanted to put them on a par, um, I would have put them on a par probably with the Brazilians. <laughs> well, in Jack terms, also did, did, but in, in military terms. <laughs> Jack, Jack also did say thanks about thanks ever so much. He said thanks indeed for writing about this neglected topic, um, and he, and he wished he had written it about this years ago. So, well, Jack, you know, Hellion's always here. Uh, and, so, <laughs> and Simon says many thanks for your interesting answer, David. Um, and I'm very sorry if I have neglected any questions. There are, there are two more. Uh, up, up, are there yeah. two more? For example. Can I, I tell you what, Tom, I'm going to leave them to you if that's all right. No, no problem. And I'll give, give my brief For example. <laughs> over to you, Tom, this, this, with, these, with these questions. This one is particularly yeah. interesting for Thank me. You, David. Uh, by David. Did British interventions in Iraq, for example, impact on relations with turkey and yeah. the other question um, is also sorry. how did the turkish government treat churchill given gallipoli was his idea yes. and the war with greece and the huge exchange of population not to say the burning of smyrna was party uh, part uh, sorry partly attributable to him Right. OK, a couple of elements there. Firstly, dealing with the um, Gallipoli. I, I mean, I think it is interesting that that most, as I said earlier, most people do think of Churchill in relation to Gallipoli. And it was his idea to knock Turkey out of the war by by, by doing that. We all know what happened. And obviously, uh, Ataturk made his name essentially militarily in that in that campaign. Um, I, I, Having said that, that I, I think it would be wrong to assume that this meant he was hostile to Turkey per se. He before World War One, he did he worked quite hard to try and get Turkey into the uh, into the Entente um, sphere of influence rather than the, the Central Powers. So I think he did do a lot of work. And after the war, 
he built bridges. I mean, there's extensive, I mean, in Churchill's papers, there are extensive um, letters and communications between him and Turkish politicians and military people uh, about, you know, Turkey and what we can do, etc. I, I think I probably disagree with the question that was David uh, in relation to the Greco-Turkish war, the Turkish war of independence and that I don't think Churchill was by any means a driving force behind that from a British perspective. I think that was Lloyd George. Um, now, obviously, Churchill was around as a politician, but I do think the the British um, encouragement of Greece, not that the Greeks needed much encouragement, uh, it had to be said to go and uh, go and send their troops to Smyrna and, and, and further inland the attack on, on Ankara. Um, so but the financing of that was very much Lord George's policy. Uh, and he had a very expansionist view at the end of World War One. Churchill was, for once, not quite as gung ho as as Lloyd George there. So I'm I'm more sympathetic to Churchill because I, you know, and Churchill, you know, has a very mixed picture. And anyone anyone who writes a, or reads about Churchill ends up saying, on the one hand, this; on the other hand, that. And I'm pretty much the same as anybody else on that. I think he, he did good things. He also did some pretty shocking things as well. Uh, so I think you mix up. I don't think I would put too much of the blame for Smyrna. Now, obviously, this is hardly the burning of Smyrna is, is highly is me as it as it is today is a highly contested piece of historiography between, between the Turks and the Greeks in particular. Um, you know, the Greeks say the Turkish forces, the irregulars burnt it down. The, the Turkish say it was already burning by the time we arrived, blah, blah, blah. Um, yeah, who knows? Um, but in fairness, putting the blame on the British for that one, I think, is, is, is pushing it. But if there is British blame, it's Lloyd George for financing the scheme mad as it was um moving on to um to iraq um yeah. surprisingly you might think um that the turks might have been they thought well you know we're 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 non-belligerent and not neutral and we're still technically allies to the british and it's important to understand that the british french um uh, turkish treaty of 1939 still stood all the way through the war turkey never revoked that treaty uh, in fact, used it as an argument for declaring war in 1945, somewhat uh -huh. cynically, but nonetheless, that's what they did. I think the Turks were not, from, from what I've read, um, and obviously one of our problems here is that we don't have access to Turkish archives as to what they were actually saying. So unlike the British archives, where I can tell you what the Foreign Office said, I can't tell you that in Turkey. In fact, the Turkish general staff archives don't even admit they've got any archives for the for the war period so it's a real problem for historians even turkish cool. historians um, who don't have access either so i think the with but from what i've read from what people have seen and um particularly you know some some very good turkish diplomatic historians have written very good books which 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 i i, I used extensively um, they they certainly implied that the Turkish government was not happy with the British. Um, they certainly didn't want the Germans and the Italians in Iraq, which is obviously what happened. Luftwaffe squadrons were flown in to 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 Iraq at that time. The British cobbled together, as as, as you will know, a, a a force both in the south at Basra and across the desert from Jordan. Um, one of their sort of jock columns, the British used to call them. Um, to the airfield near Baghdad, Habanaya. And so there was a fight there. The Iraqi army didn't perform very well. Um, the Germans didn't reinforce as quickly as they ought to have done, uh, and therefore the British won. I, I think Turkey, from what I've read, was happier with uh, an independent Turkey, although it was um, it was only on independent on paper, essentially. Independent the Iraq. I mean. mm -hmm. okay. Iraq, sorry, yeah. Yep. Iraq was technically by this time yeah. independent. The British gave up their protectorate, um, uh, but they maintained these these two air bases and yep. and control essentially the port. And they they did it. They they maintained them because it was it was a um, a link to India. Essentially, mm -hmm. it was a stopping point uh, to refuel on the way to India. But so the British um, and Wavell in particular was not at all keen when Churchill said, get troops there and, and do it. But I think the Turks were equally uh, happier to have um, a, a, an independent Turkey with a, a fairly compliant monarchy. I think probably less keen on the uh, was it the Golden Square, wasn't it, with the colonels that, uh, that, mm -hmm. um, that, that ran it. So I think they were less keen on that. 
but they were dead against the Soviets appearing in Iran because that happened next. Yeah. Uh, so this I is think, this I is also this Iraq died. This is also particularly interesting. This uh, in your book, this uh, continuous worry about the Soviet threat, or shall we say Russian threat, however you want to call it. Uh, it is it is present in almost throughout the book, really, from 1938-39 up to 45. Uh, how, because you said that that uh, approach to local archives is impossible, how did you manage to reconstruct this part of the story? Yeah, um, I mean, we've had some, I mean, like, you know, it's, it's not common for historians to have to, you know, go and find uh, sources where other people are commenting on it. Ancient historians know this all too well. You know, you, you know essentially there's a Roman view of the world and, and we have no idea what the Dacians and others thought about it. It's, in this case, I'm afraid you have to do something pretty similar. I um, mean, we do have some Turkish sources. Not, we don't have much archive access, but we do have the newspapers of the time. We do have the memoirs of Turkish politicians of the, of the time. What we do did have a brief window to, obviously, it's not there now we did have a brief window into the soviet archives so i did rely on i haven't uh -huh. personally gone through those mm -hmm. but i have relied on you know people who have done that and there are now several very good books from people who had that beaver was the first obviously but there were others who got access to it so there are now three or four fairly modern books about which are mm -hmm. based on soviet archives so much of my stuff around the 37th army um, and we've also got good Bulgarian sources. Um, Helian has published a couple of books by Bulgarian historians, which are absolutely cracking books. Couldn't recommend them more highly. I mean, they're very detailed and hugely. Uh, this is not, you know, the Europe of War series. These are weighty. Um, you know, my postman, you know, suffers every time one arrives, but they are huge tomes, but great. Um, and um, they, they got some access to, to their archives and the Soviet archives. So much of what we know about that comes from external influences, etc. Mm -hmm. But uh, you're absolutely right. The key thing, which is that when you read the British archives, the British just didn't get it all the way through the war. Um, they they have this Western. I, I think I said in the book, and I often say it to uh, to Western audiences when I'm talking about this subject, that in the Turkish archives, and there is some material, they wrote the, the series of Turkish general staff studies of World War Two. Sadly, they tell us very little about the Turkish army in World War Two, but they do tell us what they were learning about World War Two. Uh -huh. And it, and it's really you can you, I think it's still downloadable. I think since the the last failed coup. A lot of those have been lost, but I've got them saved. But it, what I suggest that people do is you take a map of Europe and you turn it round and look at it from a Turkish angle. So instead of the normal north, yeah. south, east, west projection, turn your map around. And that immediately gives you a Turkish perspective on Europe, which was I've got the Soviets uh, um, um, in my back. I've got the Germans on my mm -hmm. border. Uh, frankly, France and Spain and all of these other issues that the Foreign Office were obsessing about were irrelevant to them. The Soviet Union, bear in mind, you know, that Turkey didn't suddenly come into existence in 1923 mm -hmm. with the Republic. You know, the Russians and the Ottomans have fought wars for centuries. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, everybody in, in, in modern day Turkey you know, understood that, you know, the, the Soviet Union may have had a different ideology to the Tsar, but the objectives were still the same. Constantinople is a orthodox city as far as they're concerned, and they wanted, um, they, Stalin didn't care about, about that, but he did care about bases on the straits. Um, because Stalin was a Georgian, and it's often forgotten that Stalin fought the Russian Civil War mostly from Georgia. And most of the Allied interventions, British, French and Greek, were in, in southern Russia, uh, in the Crimea, uh, in parts of the Caucasus, etc. And Stalin didn't forget this. So Stalin in 1939 was more worried about the British. In, and, he, and he actually has some cause, if you yeah, read oh, Churchill's yeah. mad plans, um, to be concerned and he did the Germans. And the Turks, however, spent the whole war concerned about uh, Russia, but Union mm. as, as it was. So, so that, that, I think, is something that is not well understood. 
But every bit of evidence I've read in Turkey tells me that that was the Turkish focus throughout the war. And of course, at the end of the war, as we know, um, Stalin made a, a further bid both for um, territories in the north of Turkey, what's called Kars and Ardahan, um, which were part of, uh, of Russia and, and against Stalin's advice were given up by Lenin. Uh, in 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 the treaties with the early 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 in the Soviet Union, so he wanted them back, and he also wanted bases on there. In the end, I think, in fairness, he settled and didn't press it because he had Bulgaria, and mm. once you've got bases in Bulgaria, you've got naval and air force bases, you could essentially attack Istanbul without Istanbul any difficulty. Well, at all. Yes. So it, yeah, he could threaten. He could threaten oh. the Turks from there. Oh. So now, excuse me, I have to bring this to the end because it's nine o'clock and we have actually booked until now uh i would just like to point out again uh, the the link to the helium site where you can currently order sorry, um dave's book chasing the soft underbelly uh it's uh, people are time and again let's say criticizing us for making such small books or thin books but as one can one, one can hear from what dave is explaining there are years of research going into this work and it is extremely well substantiated which means there is lots of research here and extremely lots of knowledge and what i like in particular about this book is that it is so easy to follow and Plenty of, so to say, puzzles or pieces of puzzle about about World War II are suddenly coming, you know, together and making it clear what was going on, whether in the Balkans or in Italy or somewhere else. So, for the end today, I would like to thank you very much, Dave, for being with us. Pleasure. And. To all the visitors, everybody who was following us, I hope we have answered all the questions. Didn't miss any. There is one more. Sorry. There's 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 one, one more, more question. question. That, okay, one more that one came more. in from, from, from Oscar. Then we have to end. Because, <laughs> well, if you were talking because we have both. If you if you're talking about pieces of puzzles mm -hmm. and uh, and evidence, then uh, Oscar. Oscar just wrote at the very last minute, he, he said, just a piece of information from his side regarding um, oh, yes, World yeah. War I, Churchill and Turkey. Yes. And he says, as far as I remember, Turkey had ordered and paid, and he does put question marks in brackets, for two battle cruisers, which were never given to them, although they were ready. They were given to the Royal Navy, in which Churchill at that time played a major role. Could you clarify? Yes, that that that, that is my understanding. Uh, exactly, my understanding. Um, that the, that's an issue. Well, the Turk, Turkey had those. The Royal Navy and Churchill was the, I think, it was the first Sea Lord at that. Uh, no, first Lord of the Admiralty uh, that that at that. that was he first? Sea, anyway, he was he was he was in charge of the Navy, whatever the correct title was. Um, and he uh, and certainly they did. And this was and even in World War Two, this happened as well. So um, I'm afraid if you ordered weapons from a country that's just in got himself involved in the war, don't expect to have them delivered is the is, is the <laughs> is the lesson. Uh, as I said earlier, a lesson I think the modern the current Turkish government has learned as well that uh, uh, particularly in, in the Cyprus conflict when they they couldn't get any landing craft and uh, and ships because the Americans didn't didn't want so they built their own. And so uh, another story for another day. Hmm. Oh, well, Dave, can I just say thank you very much? Fascinating. And having copy edited the book, I mean, having this talk as well, really, it just it adds to it. It really brings it alive. Um, it was fantastic. Really interesting insight into strategy um, and also just the background of, of kind of where where they're at now. Um, so, yeah, everybody has said great talk, David. Thanks. Your book's on his A-list from Sander. Simon, thoroughly enjoyable. Anthony, interesting talk. David, great presentation. Kiosti, congratulations, Matt. Thank you. Thoroughly interesting. Jan, 
great presentation. And Simon, please let's have more of these talks. So, wow. Promise. <laughs> it's a promise. Yeah, well, seeing as it was my first one, whew, I hope I did all right on the chat box. I'm really sorry if I didn't answer no, we, we have questions. Quite, we have um, all the questions now. And I can promise yeah, so, you're going to have the next uh, book presentation already in two weeks. More details are going to follow online. Oh, it's another one of mine as well, I think, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> I think I might make I might make my second appearance. Uh, exactly. <laughs> and uh, anyway, I would like to close for today. Thank you very, very much, everybody, for being with us. Thank you again, Dave. And we are certainly going to have another opportunity uh quite soon in a few months at least uh and for dave to tell us a lot more i think it's, is it june the 27th is it is it the 27th the is it 7th, i don't know it's going to be the it? next book presentation uh but by son by sandra about uh suriname ah yes tropic in suriname thunder, yes thunder. tropic tropic thunder in suriname yeah <laughs> okay and thank you yeah. very much again and i'm going to close right. now have a nice evening yes to the thank UK. you good night everybody thank you everybody and have a nice afternoon to the united states and the parts of <laughs> uh, the world north and, uh, and south of the united states of course <laughs> <laughs> good night bye bye yeah goodbye from wales bye bye, <laughs> bye. bye.